Okay, we are starting chapter two on the second law of thermodynamics now. Where the second law deals with uh, entropy, disorder, and randomness. And it gets into why heat flows from a hot object to a cold object spontaneously, and uh, really what temperature is doing as the energy rearranges itself within the system. So here we're getting into the idea of the microscopic side of thermodynamics. When we tend to think of thermodynamics as dealing with uh, large-scale hot objects, cold objects, something that's the size that you could fit in your hand or bigger, and we're measuring the temperature, the pressure, the volume of these. All of that arises from the interactions at the microscopic scale, where we are applying, for many parts, Newton's laws of motion, plain old mechanics, but down at the atomic scale, or sometimes even smaller, depending on what we're dealing with, so that the laws of thermodynamics come about from the uh, I was about to say uncountably large numbers of particles. It's not really uncountably large. They are, we can give numbers to how many particles we're dealing with. A mole of particles is on the order of 10 to the 23rd power. So we're dealing with things that are, um, uh, we have some estimates of how many particles we're dealing with. But it's that the individual motions and kinetic energies and potential energies of all of these particles go together in ways that we can describe with probability. And the probabilities of what they're going to do lead into these large-scale macroscopic uh, kinds of things that we can more easily measure. The temperature, the volume, the pressure being the, the easiest, say, the total energy. Um, whereas what's going on uh, at the microscopic scale, we can't keep track of the momentum and the uh, energy of every one of those 10 to the 23rd particles. But we can keep track of these gross, large-scale kinds of features. <coughs> uh, one thing that I should point out before we start this chapter is that with this probability, uh, you often hear of the second law of thermodynamics, and which we'll define later on in the chapter, but it is in sometimes worded, uh, it is sometimes worded that things go from a state of order to a state of disorder, naturally. And that's one way of doing it, but we've got to be careful about what we mean by order and disorder. Uh, entropy tends to increase. Entropy is, roughly speaking, a measure of the disorder of the system. Again, with some caveats. And when we, when we see that, we think of it as it's stated the second law of thermodynamics, but it is a law that says not that things have to go this way, but that they are very, very likely to go this way. The probability is overwhelmingly large when you get beyond a system of more than a half a dozen particles. When you get to 10 to the 23rd and so on up like that, we're never going to live to see things go the other way. It's just so improbable as to never happen in practice. Okay, so we'll start off with something small something where we can count the particles and we can look at their individual behavior. We'll start off with what's called a two-state system. If we, again, have the mindset that in thermodynamics we're always dealing with a, a gas in a box, well, each of the particles in the gas, let's say it's a gas of hydrogen atoms, very simple, monatomic, um, um, monatomic molecules, one atom each molecule, and the, uh, the degrees of freedom are very simple. It can move along the x, the y, or the z axis, so there are three degrees of freedom there, and that's it. You don't have any rotational degrees of freedom for a single atom, and you don't have any vibrational degrees of freedom for it. So, but you get up to diatomic molecules, and now you can add that ro those uh, rotational degrees of freedom and vibrational modes. And if you get to more complex molecules, you've, you've got a whole mess of these kinds of things. 
But even those three degrees of freedom we've got there, well, let's simplify things a little bit still. Um, rather than dealing with what the momentum is, or kinetic energy, say, along any axis, which could be um, any one of them, infinitesimally changing uh, uh, range of values, a smooth possible change of low energy, medium energy, high energy, and all these possibilities in between. Let's make it even simpler. Let's deal with a system where each particle can only have two possible states of energy, either high energy or low energy, nothing in between. A two-state system. As an example, let's see here. I've got three coins. All right, I have a penny, a nickel, and a dime. Now, each of these coins, if I were to uh, toss them down like this, each one can have either a heads or a tail showing. So, what I want to know is, if I shake them up in my hand, toss them down, what are the probabilities that I'll have uh, three heads or two heads or one or whatever showing up like that. That's the large scale description, the macroscopic. How many heads do I have total? How many tails do I have total? There's also the microscopic description. What's the state of the penny? Head, uh, sorry, head or tail? And what's the state of the nickel, head or tail? What's the state of the dime, head or tail? Microscopic description is dealing with the each individual coin labeled separately. Macroscopic is, I don't care about which one has heads and which one has tails, how many total are there of each? Okay, so, if I've got a nickel, a penny, and a, a penny, a nickel, and a dime, how many ways can I have this? See, I'm going to erase this here now because I'll need the whole board. Let's say if I start off with um, heads. So I could have the penny, that head, the nickel, and the dime. All right, that's one possibility. Let's say I turn the dime up and I've got a tail there, but I leave these at heads. Now, let me flip the dime again back to, uh, to heads, and now I flip the nickel over, tails. Okay, I can flip the dime again, flip this one and that one, those are all of my possibilities. Now if you've noticed, if you've had any uh, computer classes and you think about binary, what I've just done, I've gone through the, all the possible options by simply doing how we call binary counting. Imagine that uh, heads are zeros and tails are ones. So I'm starting off with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. I'm counting in binary. This would be 1, uh, sorry, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six and seven. I just counted binary because there are two possible states in binary, zero or one, and I've got three uh, places, three place values. The first place value, the second, and the third. So what I've got here are eight possible numbers, eight possible uh, mi uh, micro states. The micro states, remember, are 
the uh, states where we label which each one has, which uh, state each individual coil has. So, let's say that I take a look at the macro state description of these, where I only count up the total number of heads and the total number of tails. So this is a uh, micro state. Uh, don't have room to label that. But let's take a look at the macro state. There, micro. Here I have three heads and zero tails. Two heads, one tail. Two heads, one tail again. One head, two tails. And so on. ran out here, let's see. Misalign them. Two heads, one tail. Ah. One head, two tails. plus tails must always equal three because I've got three coins and those are all the options I've got. Three, 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 three. All right. All of those there. There are eight possible ways. Eight distinct microstates. Okay, now. How many different macro states are there? Well, let's see. I've got three heads, zero tails. Two heads, one tail. Let's see, how many of those do I have? Uh, in fact, I could just, how am I gonna do this? I'm, I can count the number of heads. Because if I know the total number of heads, then I know how many tails there are, because I've got a fixed number of coins. So, three heads, there's one of those. Two heads, one, two, three. Three of those. Uh, one head, two tails, one, two, three and zero heads. Okay. okay. So now I've got one, two, three, four distinct macro states, where there are eight micro states that go into those. Each macro state has a different number of micro states that contribute to it. How many ways can we get two heads, for example? Well, there are three different ways. So this is what um, uh, gets us into the probability. Let me say that I could uh, histogram this. Turn the camera a bit. A 
histogram is a bar chart. And we're going to be doing a lot of these histograms where they're going to tell us the probability of each possible uh, state. So here I'm going to plot out the number of heads in each macro state, and then I'm going to give the number of micro states that, add, that go into that macro state. The number of micro states here, and then the name, the label of the macro state. So let's see, I've got to go from 0 to 3. I don't know if you can read that, but that says number of microstates. Here's the macro state, the number of heads. Okay, so for 0 heads, one, two, or three. For zero heads, I've only got one microstate that gives me that arrangement. For one head, I've got three microstates that give me one head. For two heads, I've got three microstates that contribute to that as well. And then for three heads, once again, I'm back to one microstate. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> this histogram peaks in the middle of the range and it goes down to small numbers at either end. And you'll find that this is actually pretty common. Let's see here. The way that we want to talk about this now, this is a small system, it's very easy to do. Notice that you get something that looks very roughly like a bell curve, a Gaussian. And we will find that that comes up uh, if we had a lot more particles here, a lot more coins, uh, we would found it looking smoother and much more Gaussian-like. Uh, there are Gaussians, Poisson distributions, all these other kinds that uh, go down into the corners and then peak up uh, in the middle. And uh, we'll start to see that as we get to larger and larger systems, we do get these smooth distributions that you may be familiar with. Okay. Well, let's see here. Um, now I want to count up the total number of states that I've got. If I add just erase those dashes. If I add up all of the microstates for each macrostate, I come up with one plus three plus three plus one is eight which of course I already had gotten from just counting all the individual microstates. And that tells me that that is what the area under this histogram is. One, three, three, one. If I look at the area under the, that chart, what I've done is I've integrated this. This is a distribution pattern for the system how the different uh, microstates are distributed among the macrostates. So by integrating that distribution, I come up with the total number of macros, uh, total number of microstates. Now, if I want to find, which I will, I want to find the probability that I would find the um, system, in this case the pen uh, penny, nickel, and dime, that I find the system in two heads, one tail state, macrostate. What's the probability? Well, two heads, one tail is this one here. There are three ways I can get that. 
Is this the probability? Three? No. I've got to say three out of eight possible macro states. So, um, sorry. There are three micro states that give me two heads out of a total of eight. So the probability is three eighths, three out of eight. Now we're going to need to make the probability out of what I've already done here. Let me get a new board. Okay. So the probability, in order to find that, I have to know the total number of microstates that I'm dealing with and how many microstates give me the macrostate that I'm asking about. So the first thing I need to define is what's called the multiplicity and we use the capital omega uh, to represent multiplicity. Multiplicity is the number of microstates for a given macrostate. So if I ask, what is the multiplicity of the uh, three, sorry, if I ask, what's the multiplicity of the two heads macrostate, you would say, looking back at that previous chart, three. There are three microstates that lead to two, uh, let's say two heads, three microstates that lead to two heads. So I can write it this way. Uh, let's see here. The multiplicity of a macro, uh, of a macro state, which uh, we'll have to label it somehow. Let's say lowercase n. We're dealing with perhaps the uh, number of uh, number of heads, perhaps, and we'll just call that number of heads lowercase n. Omega of n. So the multiplicity of a state n, however we want to label that state. So, and as an example, just copying down what I already had on there, if uh, n is the number of heads, so example of Ronnie, for example, Let n equal the number of heads. Then the multiplicity of, a, of the macrostate with zero heads is one. There was only one way I could get zero heads. Multiplicity of the state with one head is three. Multiplicity of the state with two heads is also three. And the multiplicity of the state with three heads is one. There was only one way to get that. All right. This is exactly what I just did with that table that I just showed you. And I use that to plot out the distribution of total number of heads as, um, yeah, uh, the distribution of the total number of heads. Uh, the microstates among the, the, those uh, heads, uh, macrostates. <coughs> okay, so I've got these four possibilities here. The probability then we use capital P for probability. The probability of a given macrostate existing is the number of microstates, uh, its multiplicity, divided by the total number of microstates. Now, 
Let me see here that I've got room. I might need to turn over a little bit. And I've got some glare, so I'll adjust the darkness. Okay. Make sure we're zoomed in as we can get. Okay, so the probability P of a macro state M is the multiplicity of that state divided by the multiplicity of all of the states, which is the total. What is the total? Well, if I add up all of these micro, these uh, multiplicities of all the different macro states here, I get the multiplicity of the entire set of them, which is 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1, 8, which I already knew, 8 possible. So if I were to say what's the probability that I'll get three, uh, two heads, probability of finding it with two heads is the multiplicity of the macro state with two heads over the total multiplicity. This was three, and that was eight. That's it. As long as we know what the distribution is of those, uh, the multiplicities are, then we're set for finding a probability. Okay, next though, it's a matter of coming up with, um, coming up with a general formula. If we, <clears throat> if we have a two-state system, we can calculate these multiplicities from theory. We don't have to go and, and uh, actually get out a penny, a nickel, and a dime and do it. We can do it from theory. Now, let me see here if we've got, let's see how the glare is on this. I think I'm going to go back to the other board. Okay, to find the number of, uh, to find the multiplicity of any macro state of a two state system, where each of your particles can either be heads or tails, or one and zero, or up and down, or whatever, we use the binomial, uh, the binomial theorem. So, if there exists, it's a nice little handy way of writing there exists, there is, there are, backwards capital E. N coins, we're going to use capital N for the total number of coins. Capital N is almost always going to be the total number of particles in the system, or of uh, objects of interest in the system. Let's see. So if I have n coins, the multiplicity of a state with of a macro state with n heads is writing this out here. This is a, a notation that we'll use. Oh, and I made a mistake already. 
Okay. Capital N is the total number of coins. Lowercase n is the number of headings. That it describes the macro state that we're interested in. So, total number first, the number that describes the macro state second. And that multiplicity is capital N factorial over lowercase n factorial times capital N minus lowercase n quantity factorial. Okay, this is the number of combinations of uh, lowercase n items chosen from capital N objects. Uh, it's sometimes called capital N choose lowercase n, n choose n, and honestly that works better if you've got different letters for them like A and B, you know, A choose B. Uh, you have this many, you choose this many out of it. Okay, uh, another way of putting this is capital N is the number of particles lowercase n is the number of particles in a certain state I should say this is total Okay, uh, the derivation of this is given in the book uh, because it comes from the fact that if you have a total number, how many ways can you choose your first one that you pull out? Choosing lowercase n of these, pulling them out and, and uh, making, uh, pulling out the number of heads. And the first time you choose this, you've got all of the, the possibilities to choose from. The second time you do it, well, you've already removed one from the system when you choose it. So now you have one fewer. And the third time you do it, you've got two fewer, and so on like this. And so the number you have available keeps getting reduced, both in the numerator and then in your denominator. Uh, anyway, the derivation, you keep uh, reducing those, and you're multiplying uh, your, the first way you do it by the second way and the third way and so on. And so that gives you factorial. Uh, and the book does a better job of describing how you derive that number. Okay, now we want to go and give an application of this, the two-state paramagnet. One thing I realize now that I forgot is that the notation for this, there's a, um, a much more compact notation we can use. I squeeze it into here. Uh, which is total number in the top inside the brace, the uh, parentheses and the number you choose in the, in the let's say, denominator in the bottom. 
So we'll see that notation used. Whenever you see that notation, you write this out. Okay, the two-state paramagnet. Now, there are different kinds of magnets. There are ferromagnets, paramagnets, there's diamagnet or diamagnetism anyway. A paramagnet is one where uh, your individual particles, you have uh, microscopic, perhaps, uh, little compass needles, and they feel an external magnetic field like the compass needle feels the magnetic field of the Earth. The compass needle wants to line up so uh, it's pointing along this external magnetic field. In the two-state paramagnet, you've got that for a whole bunch of little magnetic compass needles. And all of them individually want to line up with the magnetic field that's coming in from the outside, like the Earth's magnetic field. The key thing is that in a paramagnet, each of the little, we call them dipoles, dipoles, because they've got a north and a south pole. Uh, an up and a down, you could say. These dipoles individually don't interact with each other. The state of one dipole does not affect the one next to it. They're far enough apart that they don't feel each other. Uh, by the way, if they were close together so that or had a strong magnetic field of their own so that they did influence each other, uh, you could get a ferromagnet, ferro from iron. And this is how permanent magnets work, and electro electromagnets are different. Uh, anyway, how permanent magnets work, they affect each other's field and they all try to line up with each other. This will not be the case for us. They will all be independent. Okay, so let's say that we have an external magnetic field. We always use, um, almost always use, the capital B, B for the magnetic field. And I put a vector symbol over it. Uh, just because it, it has a direction. Magnetic field will have going up. So, the dipoles, the individual dipoles, have a little arrow on them. They can be uh, up or down. They want to line up with the field. So, this is the external field. Here are your dipoles. Each one of these. And you can have some large number of these or small number of whatever. Now, because they want to line up with the field, that gives them means that they have the lowest potential energy when they are aligned with the external magnetic field. This is nature taking the easy way out. Nature always wants to be in the state of the lowest possible energy. Uh, it's actually it's a principle of nature. In fact, it's Hamilton's principle, no relation as far as I know. So each one of these dipoles can be in a state up or down. And by the way, why not in between? Well, in practice, we're dealing with quantum mechanical systems. And there are, in quantum mechanics, um, you can wind up with these states where you can't have a state in between. It must be this way or that way. And that's what we're going to be dealing with. It makes it simple. Okay. So, uh, let's see here. I can count the number that are up and the number that are down. So I'm going to write N sub up with an up arrow is the uh, number pointing up. N sub down is the number pointing down. How many total do I have? Well, if they can only be up or down, if I add the number up plus the number down, I've got the total number. assume that the total number of dipoles is fixed in our system.
So we're not changing the total number. Okay, now with this in mind, let's figure out the multiplicity of a state that has in up. I'll erase this other one. Closer. Okay, that ought to be better. <coughs> I'll rewrite that equation. This will be important. The total number is the number up plus the number down. Now, the general formula for the multiplicity of a two-state system that's something we're given is capital N factorial divided by lowercase n factorial times capital minus lowercase n factorial. So I'm boxing that in as well because it's a general formula we've already learned. So let me write down the multiplicity of the uh, two-state paramagnet in terms of the number pointing up. Capital N. We have capital N, we choose N up. Okay. Simple enough. Also note that the number, the total number minus the number up is the number down. So that's also something there. So in the denominator, we've got one option factorial times the other option factorial when there are only two options. And that'll be important later too. All right. So why are we interested in the total number pointing up? Because the energy of a two-state paramagnet depends on whether the dipoles are pointing up or down. The low energy state is pointing up because it's aligned with the magnetic field. It doesn't take any resistance, doesn't take any potential energy to point with the field. If you're pointing against the field, well, the field is trying to turn you. So you've got some potential energy if you're pointing against the field, pointing down. Uh, I know it may be a little confusing that uh, we think of things going down as the low energy state, but here we get the field up. Gravity, well, of course, we got it the other way. Don't worry about that right now. So the reason we're interested in this is by specifying the total number up, we have an idea of the total energy of the system. It also would be the same as if we specify the total number down, uh, which uh, would be a larger amount of energy. So specifying the macro state will specify the total energy of the system.
Let's see here. All right. Uh, one more topic for us to go over, and that's the multiplicity of another kind of system. We'll come back to the two-state paramagnet. Um, it seems to be kind of a contrived system, but they, these things do exist uh, out there. Um, but let's go to one that's a little more useful, and that is the Einstein's model of a solid. I'll go back to the other board here. Einstein in 1907 came up with a simple model of how solids behave at a microscopic level, which allowed us to calculate the energies and things like this from them. So Einstein's model of solid treats it as if it is in a uh, cube-shaped lattice, a, a crystal, basically, where each atom is connected by springs, molecular bonds, to uh, six other atoms. So here's the atom I'm interested in, along the z-axis it's got springs, molecular bonds connecting it to the ones above and below, that's one degree, uh, sorry, one axis that it can move along. We don't worry about the fact that there are two springs. Um, this is held in place in such a way that if the atom moves up, it compresses one spring and stretches the other. It's really the same as if it had just one spring attaching it to one above it, but uh, don't worry about the mechanics. That's one axis it can move on. Okay, the y-axis there is another axis it can move on. and then the x-axis. And then each of these six other atoms is attached to an additional uh, lattice like that. additional for each one of those. We've already counted six. Okay, so its motion is constrained along three axes. Each one of those axes has a, an oscillator, a harmonic oscillator. Uh, motion with a traditional kind of spring gives you what's called simple harmonic motion. Now let's see here. Um, it turns out that what we're going to be interested in is not, we're not going to be counting atoms in this, we're going to be counting the oscillators, the vibrational modes, uh, vibrational uh, uh, axes. So each atom has three directions it can vibrate in, and, so we, and those are independent in this simple model. Its vibration along the x-axis is completely independent of its vibration along the y-axis or the z-axis. So we can vibrate really fast this way, and maybe not at all this way, and maybe it's sort of in the middle that way. And these will not, um, one, the, the choice of how it vibrates in one way does not affect how it vibrates in the other way. So these are three independent vibrations, a vibration axes. So we'll count the number of oscillators.
for a given oscillator, the potential energy is a parabola. Depending on how far in, let's say, x, the, uh, uh, the atom stretches that spring, it gains more potential energy the farther it's stretched up. That's that parabola there. Where the potential energy, capital U, this is uh, energy goes up. The potential energy will be capital U, and it's one half k x squared. Now that k is I've got to distinguish. That's the spring constant of the molecular bond. How tightly uh, sprung the spring is. So I'll put an S underneath it because there's also Boltzmann's constant, which is a lowercase k as well. So I'm distinguishing that here. Okay. Now the energy that a, a quantum mechanical oscillator down at this quantum mechanical level can have, it can have only certain amounts of total energy. Uh, not values in between. This is quantized then. So it can have this much. That's the lowest it can have. It can't get down to zero, but we'll just rescale this. It can have this much, or that much, or this much. These energy levels are evenly spaced out for a quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator. Now, if we have F, at lowercase f as the frequency with which it's vibrating, uh, and h is Planck's constant, then, let's see, if you look up in your book Planck's constant, it has a value of dramatic pause here. Let's see. 4.136 times 10 to the minus 15th electron volts times seconds, or in uh, MKS units, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules times seconds. Uh, which one we use depends on what's more convenient for us. The electron volt is a lot smaller and is sometimes uh, easier to use, uh, because, but we still have a very, very tiny exponent. Okay, now then the amount of energy for each one of these is going to be a multiple of Planck's constant times the frequency. The ground state, the bottom one, that's the minimum it can have, has an energy of one-half hf, one-half Planck's constant times the frequency. The first excited state above ground is 3 halves HF. The second excited state five halves HF and so on up like that. You'll notice the spacings are even. HF is the spacing between each one of these. And so on. <clears throat> now, the uh, in fact I should point out then that starting from the ground level, we either have zero energy relative to ground. Okay, we'll just count the ground level as having zero energy that we can extract from it. You can't get below the ground state. The first state has one HF of energy. The second state, then, 
has two HF of energy, the third state has three HF of energy, and so on up like that. So we can count the energy of this relative to the ground pretty easily. Okay. Now, note that if we have um, 10 atoms, we have, well, three axes for each atom, we have 30 oscillators. So if we're counting the number of oscillators, let's make the number of oscillators be n. Therefore, the number of atoms is n over 3. OK. So how do we find the multiplicity of these? This is a little trickier, because now each oscillator can have, well, not an infinite amount of energy, but there's no real upper limit to the amount of energy that one oscillator can have. We're only limited by the total energy of the whole system, which we'll consider like this. So the question is, how, if you have a whole set of these things laid out there, how is the energy of the system distributed among all the different oscillators? Let's take a look at this next board. count oscillators, not atoms. So e and each oscillator is independent of the others. So if I have n oscillators, I'm writing out, drawing their potential energy diagrams. all the way up to number n. <clears throat> and I'll label these individual states they can be in by 0 HF, 1 HF, 2 HF, and so on. And of course, they have, in principle, an unlimited number of possible energy states on above that. So energy goes up. OK. So I want to, to have some expression that gets me the multiplicity of, if I have n oscillators, um, and I have a certain uh, total amount of energy. How can that be divvied up among them? And what's the multiplicity of those different states? OK, this is the subtle thing. Let's say that I've got Because each quantum of energy, each unit of energy, is some multiple of HF, then I'll use lowercase q to mean a quantum, an amount, discrete amount of energy. And I'll, ha I'll just count how many quantum. If all the energy I had in the whole system was just this right here, 2 HF, I would have 2 quanta of energy. And maybe this one has 0 HF, so that's has 0 in it, so on like that.
where the total energy will be uh, Q times HF. Make sure I've written that down correctly. So the amount of energy is QHF. This is how many, how many units of energy. Okay. Now, let's say that I've got the system drawn up this way. Let's say uh, oscillator number one has two quanta. Oscillator two has one quantum. 3 has 2 quanta, 4 has 0, and all up to number n, which maybe has 1, whatever it is. Okay, so there's a way I can diagram this. Let me erase what I've just drawn here. Let's put a bar between each oscillator underneath here. I don't need a bar at the very end because there's nothing else over to the right. These bars will just divide the drawing of one oscillator from another. Count the number of quanta of energy. Two here. <clears throat> I'll just draw some little uh, uh, colored in circles to represent. Each circle represents one quantum en of energy for that oscillator. So two here. One here, uh, two here, zero here, and then some other oscillators in between, and two here. Okay. Now, in order to, how would we use that binomial uh, uh, formula that we had before? when we have number of oscillators and, and quanta of energy per oscillator, and we don't have a two-state system in that sense. This is the brilliant, really clever thing. While capital N and lowercase q don't represent two possible states, it's not like it's q or not q, it's you know, 1q, 2q, 3q, whatever. In this diagram, I've got two symbols, bars and circles, dots. How many ways can I arrange the bars and the dots? That's where we can use that two-state formula. That's the clever bit. I'm going to get the book back out to draw it. So, what I have now, if I have, uh, how many total symbols do I have? Think now of this being very abstract, let's just draw this. Forget about what it represents for a moment. I have two different symbols, bars and dots. And how many total symbols do I have? Well, let's say I've got, oh, it's just Q uh, dots plus if I've got n oscillators, how many bars? It's n minus 1, because I've got a bar in between every pair of oscillators. So if I start, the first one has a bar to the right, the second one, another to the right, and so on. The nth one out here does not have a bar to the right, because there's nothing over to, uh, uh, to divide it from. So I've got q dots and n minus 1 bars. So, if I'm interested in the uh, a way of choosing how many dots I've got out of Q plus N minus 1 symbols, I 
I want, I've got Q plus N minus one, and I'm choosing Q, quantum of energy out of that, Q dots. here is, sure, in oscillators, and I'm picking Q units of energy, uh, but I've got to keep in mind that the formula is the total number of things, uh, symbols here, Q plus N minus 1, choose Q. So, just as I did before, total number in the numerator, this in the first term in the denominator, uh, and it's of course factorial, times whatever's on the left, total minus q, which would be q plus n minus 1 minus q, it's just n minus 1 factorial. And that's the formula for the multiplicity of an Einstein solve. This will allow us to tell the probability that if we have Q units of energy, meaning uh, QHF, actual energy and normal energy units, and I've got um, N over three atoms, I can find the probability that the system will have a certain, um, certain arrangement of this um, by dividing the multiplicity of that state by the total multiplicity that I've got. And we'll end it here. And the next lesson, we'll start off talking about interacting systems, how they exchange energy from one to another. And we'll start to see things about heat flow and such.